So good afternoon. First, first a qualifier, I'm no longer a doctor. I used to be a medical doctor, I'm not really anymore. Uh, you wouldn't want me taking care of anyone you actually like or care about, but outside of that I might be of use. Uh, also, thank you for the Asia Forum for inviting me here, it's spectacular. Any excuse I can use to come to the Philippines, I generally will do. Um, I've spent quite a lot of time motorcycling around various provinces, I didn't really crash, I almost did a couple times. Uh, so it's been a real pleasure. Now, what I wanna to talk to you about is Asia's super platforms, and China's super platforms in particular, and the idea of digital transformation. Uh, and it's interesting because as I've listened to the talks for the last two days, what jumped out at me is I am more optimistic than anybody in this room. Like, I'll put that stake in the ground right now. I am the single most excited, optimistic person in this room, maybe in the two days we've been here. Uh, I'm a pure breed, I'm a business person. So, listening to educators and people who work in social enterprise and other things, it's very interesting to me, but I'm a little bit outside of that. So, my optimism is all about being a business guy. Uh, and here's basically my argument. What is going on now not in 10 years, not in 15 years, right now, this year, the next four to five years, is perhaps the biggest change we've seen in the economy since the Industrial Revolution. That's not hyperbole, I think it's true. I think what's going on is gonna change everything, mostly for the better, with some problems. Uh, and it's hard not to be very excited about it, and I'm based in China, which is one of the epicenters for where this is happening most quickly, and in many ways most powerfully. So I'm gonna give you some examples of that in the next couple minutes. A little bit about my background. Basically my area is digital China and consumer China, and these are more or less the same topic today. If you're talking about Chinese consumers, you're talking about smartphones, you're talking about apps, they're all the same now. I used to work for a man named Prince Al Walid for a long time. He is a well-known Saudi prince. For those of you who have been following the news out of Saudi Arabia in the last six months, you might have picked up his name. Uh, MBA, MD, based, I'm based in New York and Beijing. Okay, skip that, skip that. And this is home base academically, which is Peking University in Beijing. For those of you who are familiar with the campus, Yes, the sky is never that blue. Uh, but I didn't actually doctor that photo. I took it, it's, it was real. Okay, so digital transformation. Why is it such a big deal? And I'll give you an example. I'm gonna first give you a process. Four steps for how this happens. Um, and you can see this pattern over and over and over. So it's a good pattern to keep an eye out for. And I'll give you an example of one case that was it wasn't high tech. It wasn't something new. It was a very simple, almost boring business that got transformed in such a way that it stunned everybody. So step one in this process is the digital leaders, whether they're new digital companies or whether they're traditional companies that are digitizing, what they tend to do first is to give their customers exactly what they want, exactly. Um, and if you don't do this, someone might do it to you. And here's an example. This is, I took this outside of the Shanghai metro station. Bike sharing. Bike sharing is not sexy. Bicycle rentals are not sexy. Bicycles have been around for 150 years. Renting bikes has probably been along just as, you know, as long. How did this happen such that in late 2016, a couple of companies, one of them based at Peking University by some students, launched this business, bike sharing, where you, you come out, the bikes are on the street, you snap it with your phone, you pay with mobile payment, you hop on, you ride three blocks, you kick off, and you walk. 12 million bikes get deployed in about a year in 400 cities. They are everywhere. Everyone starts riding in huge numbers. People like me who haven't ridden since we're a kid 
are now riding every day. The bike companies, like manufacturers in Taiwan and China, have no idea what happened. Their business was very simple and straightforward. We make bikes, here's our competitors, we've been fighting for 30 years. Within 12 months, they get hammered to the point they still don't know what happened. So this is a question, and if you had asked any venture capitalist in 2015, I want to go into bicycles, you wouldn't have probably got the meeting. Nobody saw it coming. Now, they also launched about 30 of these bikes, companies, they ran out of colors because they were all colored. So at the end of the phase, when the last like five were being launched, they had to use like multicolors because there weren't any more pure colors left. Now this is the question I would put to you. This is not an online service. This is not like email or WhatsApp or WeChat. This is in the world. What other physical product or service has gone from nothing to permeating your life so quickly? Cell phones took many years. Cell phones took you know, five years. This went from an idea to I can't walk 10 feet without seeing one of these bikes. I will count in my head, how long can I go before I see another one and I never make it to 10 seconds? What other physical product has done that? And that's why I think this whole digital transformation thing is so important because we're seeing explosive growth in the real world the same way we've only seen it in the online world before. Email grew pretty fast, WeChat grew pretty fast. We've never seen it in the real world such that you see pictures with all those bikes. That's digital transformation taking a sleeping industry that wasn't that sexy and turning it on its head in record speed and everyone got stunned. That's the pattern. So step one is you're gonna see stuff like this. Now how did they do this? Now step one was they, they gave customers what they want. They purified the demand. Steve Jobs famously did this when he said, look, you don't have to buy the whole CD anymore. You can just buy the song you want. Oh, and by the way, you don't have to go to the store anymore. You can get it on your computer and you can listen to it anywhere. He boiled it down to what people want. Give people what they want, where they want, how they want it. Anyone who's not doing that, you are at risk for a digital tool taking you down. Netflix did the same thing. You don't have to watch TV when we tell you the show's on. You watch whenever you want. You don't have to watch ads, those are gone. You can watch on your iPad, on your iPhone, wherever you want. You know, simplified, purified demand. And when you do that, this is why it's powerful. Bicycles didn't convince people that this was a cool idea. What they did is they exposed the fact that there was already a sea of demand, that people already liked bicycles. We weren't riding them because it was a pain. And once you remove the pain, that sea of demand that was always there just gushed out. That's what these companies are doing. They're releasing latent demand that's always been there. And you can go sort of, you know, groceries, all these companies are doing the same thing. They're not convincing some people to do something new. They're tapping in demand by making it, giving people what they want. And any company that's not doing that, uh, you're at risk. If you're bundling products, you're at risk. If you're using one group of customers to subsidize your other customers, you're at risk. If you're saying, look, you can buy it today, but you don't get it for a certain amount of time, you're at risk. If you have to go get it, you're at risk. Demand is give it to them now, give it to them how they want it, right now, where they want, or someone else will. That's sort of step one. And a lot of these companies, this is how they jump out. Now step two, what you'll see them doing, is they will take the operations of a business everyone knows and they will digitize it and reimagine it. I love this slide. This is one of these bikes over the course of a year. It's just one bike. This is Shanghai. <coughs> Now you can see it jumps the river. I'm not quite sure how it jumps the river every now and then. Uh, but they reimagined bike rentals such that there are no stores anymore. There are no sales staff. There are no, sh there's no shelf space. There's no offices. You just literally, this is how crazy it is. 
you make the bike in the office, which is where they made them, you take them downtown, you put them on the sidewalk, and you walk away. What other business has ever done that? What company in Manila is taking their assets, putting them downtown on the sidewalk, and just leaving them? You know, Starbucks, they bring their tables in at the end of the day, right? The vending machines are locked down. These bikes just live on their own, like you're releasing your dog out into the wilderness. You know, good luck, my friend. Um, now that has some power to it when you reimagine the business model because the first thing you do is you get rid of a lot of costs. There's two companies in this picture in Beijing. Guess which one is paying for advertising and which one isn't. These bikes market themselves. You don't need advertising. None of these companies advertise. The bike does the advertising. The bike sells the product. You don't need sales staff. You don't need stores. You walk up, you click it with your phone. It sells itself and it delivers the service itself. This, these things are independent. They kind of live on their own, like animals in the wild. And because they don't need support, there's no limit to how many of them you can release. If I can release five, why can't I release 5,000, 5 million, 10 million? And so one thing we're starting to see is as you digitize your operations, um, Things, you know, this idea of are we going to have 10,000 cars that just drive themselves around the city at all times and pick us up and drop us off? Are we going to see trucks that just cruise the countryside picking up and dropping off without any support? And because they don't need much support, you can release them in the thousands. So it was a totally new business model. And then the third point is. Step three, so that's number two. Then you see the operations totally being reimagined. Step three is you start to see super platforms emerge. This is an electric scooter. Now if I'm using my cell phone, can't I just kind of click on this and the bicycle? Why are there two apps on my phone? You know, what if it's ride sharing, hailing a taxi, buying a plane ticket? Well, let's say buying a metro ticket, buying a bus ticket. Very quickly you realize mobility super app, where everything you need in life to get from here to there is one function on your phone. So these industries are starting to collapse into these super platforms, uh, one for mobility. Oh, this is my favorite one. This is the Shenzhen subway in 2003. This is last year. So one of the reasons I say, look, this is happening faster in China is because while this transformation is happening, this new industrial revolution, trans, you know, while this is happening, we're also seeing massive development happening at the same time. So they feed off each other. Uh, that's why it tends to happen faster than, say, New York City. You can't go to New York City and deploy 10,000 bicycles on the street without permission, which they did in China. Well, you can, but you'll get arrested. Um, so bike rentals are quickly becoming a super platform for mobility. All the online assets, all the offline physical assets, cars, taxis, bicycles, are all being integrated into one system. And one of the interesting things that happens because of this is industry barriers start to fall. People you thought you were competing against are no longer your competitors. Suddenly, bike sharing companies get blind, bike companies get blindsided by software companies. Suddenly, car companies are realizing they have to compete with Apple and Google, who are now making cars that drive by themselves. By the way, you know, there was, they asked Elon Musk, "How autonomous will your cars be?" And he says, "We're not designing steering wheels in them." So. One consequence of these super platforms uh, where you know, all these functions are one, um, the industry barriers fall, people are getting blindsided, and that's pretty much what happened to the bike companies. They didn't see this coming because they weren't looking outside their industry. But tech tools, software, AI, all these things, they jump across these industries like it's nothing. If you control the customers, you're in great position. Okay, now this is a slide from McKinsey. Uh, they basically have made this sort of prediction that in the future, like five, let's say ten years, we may see most of the business world being 20 super platforms 
that cover certain aspects of our lives. We'll have the mobility platform that does everything we need to move ourselves from one location to another. We have a commerce platform where we buy product services, books, food, groceries, delivery to my house, movies, digital media. Uh, we may have financial services platform that everything in my life, payments, insurance, all of that is there. Healthcare. I go on my phone, I, I make a doctor's appointment, I do an online consultation like this, I send a chest film, it gets read, the drugs get delivered to my house, my insurance company reimburses, all on one app. So we're starting to see these sort of super platforms emerge. A couple more minutes. A uh, couple examples I'll leave you with outside of bicycles. Alibaba's new retail. They are buying supermarkets, convenience stores, department stores, it's all becoming one. I can literally, on my way home in China, I can pull out my phone, I can buy a book and a movie and some licorice to watch the movie and lobster that will be cooked at the supermarket down the street from my house and it will all be at my house when I arrive. And I'll pay for it with the, my mobile payment. And as I'm doing this, I can read about where the lobster came from. I can pull the history of the lobster. This one was born in, you know. Uh, new retail, those are the lobsters. I didn't make that up. You can see she's actually pulling up the history of those lobsters. Uh, this is Jingdong. Jingdong has these autonomous delivery vehicles that move around. So if I'm sitting in an office, I can sort of, these are on their campus. They're not deployed beyond that yet. I can call, buy a book. One of these little things will come puttering up. I walk, it scans my face and one of those compartments opens and I take my book. Or I use a phone, probably. It's hard to pay in cash in China. People don't pay cash anymore. Uh, you walk down the street and homeless folks have QR codes. And you, uh, drones. Uh, this is a healthcare app, a super app that's emerging. Um, by a good doctor, I won't go into this, but it's pretty amazing. I do a lot of healthcare. Uh, financial services, Alibaba, you about. I won't go through all these, but then you see, back to my sort of initial point, and this will be kind of my last point. For all of this that's predictable, half of it's not predictable. Nobody saw the bikes coming. These are karaoke booths in the subway in, in Beijing. So as you're walking, you pull out your phone, you scan it, you pay, the door unlocks, you and your buddy sit on two stools and you can sing a couple songs. <laughs> They're all over the place. It's a very popular thing. You see them more in department stores and in shopping malls on Saturdays, people do it, but you can see them in the subway too. This is a, a vending machine that squeezes the oranges in the machine and makes like fresh juice. It's very popular with kids. This father's buying it for his two daughters who are watching uh, the skating in the shopping mall. Uh, anyway, so there's lots of surprising things that are happening in addition, which is why this is so fun. Okay, last point. Step four. Step one, give customers what they want. That's your line of attack, especially in traditional industries. Step two, reimagine and digitize your operations. Step three, get ready for super platforms. Step four, the big leaders of China are all coming to Asia and Southeast Asia in particular. This is viewed by most of them as a strategic imperative. They don't feel the need to necessarily go to Brazil or Mexico, although they are right now. They do feel a strategic need to be in Asia. So this is all coming here. Now I think it's spectacular and exciting, but if you're competing against them, that's another story entirely. Okay. That's basically my points on this. Um, you know, sort of, I guess my last point would be, be excited. <clears throat> it's amazing. We're living through something people have never seen anything like this before. The next five years may be the most exciting time, of, at least for a business person of our lives in that sense. Uh, so be excited, be optimistic. Uh, the caveat, um, be agile, get ready to change, be fast on your feet, because this wave could easily throw you. So you gotta learn to move and bob and weave because the world's gonna change very quickly. 
That's amazing. It's also a little problematic. And that's basically my point. So please, thank you so much for uh, listening. Thank you to the Asian for inviting me. Thank you so much, Dr. Tawson, that we can have you stay on the stage. As this is the last insight session, we're going to allow one question. So the first hand up will get that question, and you'll have two minutes to answer as we're short on time. <laughs> oh, should we do three? No, we'll do one. Okay, so one question, first hand up. Will bike sharing go international? Fast answer. It has been successful and it's launched in Mexico. It's launching in, in Santiago. I was at both of them. Well, not the, I was at the Mexico one, launched in Thailand. Bike sharing launched in Milan, Manchester. Bikes seem to be very popular. People do like riding them. Um, there are some limits. Hills are a problem. All the bikes end up at the bottom of the hills. You gotta move them back up. Um, Payment, if people aren't on mobile payment, everyone on China is on mobile payment, which makes a lot of this easier. And the third bit is, Chinese consumers have shown themselves to be the most enthusiastic adopters of anything with a QR code. It surprises everybody. It happens other places, but it's just faster there. Thank you very much, Dr. Tawson. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Tawson. I'd like to start by asking you more about what you do and maybe a little bit more about um, what you're passionate about as well. Well, I mean, I'm a, I'm a professor at Peking University in Beijing. Uh, I do a lot of research on sort of Chinese consumers and digital China, which is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. So this is Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, and all the other ones that people don't know about yet, but they will. So I sort of study the those companies, the competitive dynamics, and uh, increasingly, and what I'm talking about here today is how these companies are coming to Asia more broadly. They were massive in China, now they're going to be massive in Asia, uh, maybe as far as India, but they're all going international right now. So that's kind of the, the topic for today, and that's sort of my main area of research right now. Um, I'd like to ask, um, considering your collective professional and life experiences, what are the things you feel, what is your take about the future you imagine? The conference or? Yeah, about basically about the theme. So basically your hopes for the future. I mean, the conference has been interesting because we have people from all over the spectrum, right? We have policy people and sociologists and technology. And okay, I don't understand most of that. Okay. I understand business and Reimagine is a word we use a lot now in business because most businesses, many businesses, are having to reimagine what they do because things are changing dramatically. Um, if you are a book publisher, that business is completely sort of changed. If you're in retail, that business is being turned on its head. Banks, financial services, healthcare, and it has a lot to do with software, AI, digital tools, Internet of Things. But every, I mean, this, we use this word a lot, reimagine. You know, think about your business from scratch and recognize that a lot of it may change and it can happen very, very quickly. Not five years, six months. And someone will enter and do something you can't do in your field uh, because they've built themselves a different animal. So definitely reimagine is something we're thinking about. Um, that's the competitive dynamic side. Now, if you look at the consumer side, how this is how we would interact with this. Yeah. Okay, I pick up my smartphone in China, I can pay my bills, I can order a lobster at my office, on my phone, it'll be cooked in the supermarket, down the street from my place, I'll pick it up on the way home and it'll be ready. So for us, everything's, not ev most everything's changing. Mm -hmm. I can order a bicycle and a car and a train ticket and it all integrates and it, you know, so much is just, for us it's all getting better. Yeah. More convenient, easier to use. Generally, it's a lot cheaper, if not free. Uh, so, for us, reimagined is just, I'd say everything's getting better, but like a lot of things are getting a lot better very quickly. So, that's great for us. Yeah. So, considering all these changes, all the good and the 
well, good and the, so for some people it could be bad things. Right? If you're considering all the wonderful stuff happening in in the in in the things like in in retrospect like in in relation to what's going to happen in the future. What do you think are skills that are necessary to prepare people for that? Because we all see how everything, how the world is both big and small at this point, and how everything is just going fast. What do you think? What do you think are not are skills necessary? And at the same time, how could we catch up? Yeah, this is. People have talked about this this at this conference. Um, if you're a business person, you have a business. You have to worry about being disrupted. Someone's going to come in, and what you do is not going to be as good or as valuable in the market, or maybe obsolete. You know, um, if you're a book publisher, I, I publish books. Okay, I don't use publishers anymore. I just publish myself. So that business was seriously impacted, right? And what we always tell businesses: look, don't hide from disruption. Disrupt yourself first. Do it to yourself. Okay. I think we're starting to give that advice to people now too. You have a certain skill set you've spent years developing. According to I think McKinsey, you know, 50% of jobs can be automated within 10 years. So we're getting disrupted at the personal level now. You know, your skill that you've trained in may not be very valuable in five years. So don't hide from it. Disrupt yourself, like get ahead of it and say look I'm really good at publishing I'm really good at writing um, photography photography is a difficult one uh, people who make music uh, revenues are down like 50% um, don't wait for it to be done to you do it to yourself and for business folks that's actually relatively comfortable but for a lot of professions that's very disruptive to their lives you know they have a life built on the fact that I'm a radiologist I'm not a radiologist but I'm a radiologist yeah. I have a big house I have a big mortgage suddenly AI can do radiology as well if not better than the radiologist so I, mean, I try to tell my students look disrupt yourself first don't take on any debt stick away some cash get ready to move you know be flexible um, so but you know, that's a business person's perspective on this question. But a lot of what the discussion here is like, this is going to be very difficult for a lot of people's lives. And that's not a small social thing. So, yeah, there will be like a big impact on that. And, yeah, it's a little scary for a lot of people. Actually, it's more than a little scary. It's, it's pretty scary for a lot of people. Okay, speaking of scary, I have a question about that. Um, so can, you've been an entrepreneur. You're, you're China's most. Really you're, deal you're, guy. yeah, you're a deal guy. You're China's most followed professor. You're, you're a thought leader. And what I want to ask is, considering all the things that you've, you've experienced, uh, what do you think? What inspires you the most about the future, and what scares you the most about it? Um, that's a good question. What inspires me? I think Asia is amazing. I think China is amazing. I think Asia is amazing. I think, you know, we're seeing something. I mean, it, this is a historic thing. We go back 30 years, you know, 50% of the human population basically lived in poverty. And 50% of the, the human population had sort of risen and industrialized and middle class and families and braces and go to the movies. But 50% of the human population was left out. Now I think what we're seeing, especially in Asia, but also other places, we're seeing the other half of the, the human race catch up. Suddenly you go to China and people have braces. They never had braces before. They're buying their first home. They never owned a home before. They're buying their first car. Never could do that before. Uh, China did that. South Korea did that. Singapore did that. Uh, we're seeing that now in Southeast Asia, Vietnam, uh, Philippines, but that's a bit of a more mixed picture. So, you know, big picture, half the human race is doing dramatically better than it ever has because they kind of got left out so that's all good and the number you can look at is how many people live on one dollar a day and that number in china has decreased by like 300 million in the last 20 years so that's amazing so i love all that and i just within that story asia is probably the most exciting um, so that's cool um, stuff that scares me a bit does anything scare me? I think pollution issues bother me a lot. Um, environmental stuff bothers me a lot. Um, like I could easily be an environmental activist. Like, yeah, I could be like totally crazy in that regard. 
because the engine that's moving everybody up so quickly, you can't ignore the fact that like, you know, the water is very dirty and the air is very dirty. So this great engine of progress, you know, seems to be spinning off this, this problem. Um, I don't have a solution to that. It's out of my field of expertise, but that's the one that probably bothers me. You know, if 50% of the rivers of China are polluted, which they are, I mean, really, that's a big price to pay for progress. Um, so that, that, that's probably my one thing, but I, I don't really know much about it. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, we're down to our last. So we've talked about environmental stewardship, things that make us stick. Okay, my question is, what's your call to action for the delegates of this conference beyond, beyond this event, beyond these two days? Yeah, it's hard because I speak to business people so much, and this is not a business you know, group, yeah. overwhelmingly. Um, I would say start to understand artificial intelligence as and digital strategy that's more of a business question artificial intelligence um, it's gonna change almost everything and if if it's a mystery to you one you won't know what's going on that would be very anxiety provoking um, but it, it seems to be that's gonna be a mandatory level of understanding of the world and you know, just buy books and go to conferences and start watching YouTube videos and start to get yourself knowledgeable about what this means beyond the term. And one, I think maybe you'll find some opportunities. It'll probably open some doors for your career. If you're the only person in your company who understands this and most people don't, uh, that's cool. Um, and then also maybe it'll take care of some of the anxiety you know, the worry that this great thing is happening and I don't understand it. Um, but that's sort of a teacher's approach, right? So my call to action would be a teacher's call to action. Start reading about AI and get comfortable with the subject. All right. so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Jeff Tosin. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Yeah. Thank you much. Yes.